As good. Okay. <laughs> hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. I hope you are doing well. Uh, thank you for watching on YouTube this exclusive Twitch stream and interview that we're doing right here with singer, songwriter, the phenomenal Miss Leanne La Havas, whose new self-titled record has just dropped this year, reviewed it recently. And uh, we're going to ask her as many questions as we possibly can about that and anything else that pops up. How are you doing? I'm good. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much. It's How amazing. Are you? It's amazing to have you here. Been following Thanks, your man. music for quite a while. Um, I believe, I, I can't remember. I mean, um, it was either my significant other or maybe some blogs that turned me on to your debut. And I've been, a, yeah. you know, just a fan of your work ever since. And it's been fantastic watching the progression to this new album, um, which one thing that struck me about it when it first came out is that it's a uh, self-titled what made you kind of go with a self-titled record third time around do you feel like what you did on this album is sort of a self-defining kind of moment um in a word yes i i actually decided as soon as i had released my second album that this album would be called the self-titled album um it's because i I enjoyed making my last two albums and, um, you know, I had, I, I had a certain level of expression that I think was satisfied, but I always felt I could go a bit more, a bit deeper. I still had more to say that I wanted to be able to stand by the entire thing, um, mm. just and be able to, you know, just say, yeah, this is definitely all my decision. So I, I put it out there at the beginning of the process. Um, when you're talking about going deeper depth in general, like what exactly do you feel like you're digging deeper into on this new LP that maybe you weren't on, for example, blood? Mm. Um, I'd say, I guess, you know, subject matters is mm. kind of an obvious one. This is definitely more personal than I think I've ever got before on, 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 on an album. Mm. And also musically and production wise, I long to be a producer. Um, mm. So I thought what better place to start than with my own material. Mm. So um, I use this album as an opportunity to flex that muscle um, so yeah, this is really what you're getting. It's absolutely my taste and every decision that you hear was my own. And I did it with everyone that I love, my, all my close friends um, and the people I trust the most. So yeah. Um, you know, can you tell me a little bit about your feelings in terms of your decision to maybe drift away from, I guess, the musical style and the instrumental makeup you were going for on Blood? Because in comparison, instrumentally, I feel like there's a pretty radical change between these two albums, whereas Blood by Comparison mm. is so much more methodically assembled, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think very tightly wound, like a super contemporary pop record, which obviously has notes of soul throughout it, but it, it in a way it feels almost... Um, very tightly packaged and maybe in a way commercial too, not in a bad way. I mean, there's lots of great commercial mm. pop out there, but uh, yeah. the new record by comparison feels so much more loose and, you know, sort of mm. like organic in a way. Yeah. I, I love that about it. Uh, that was my intention. I was, I was exploring a lot of different styles, I think on blood. Um, mm. It was kind of a, you know, let's just see what, she comes up with kind of thing um so I just set out to do whatever I wanted really and just find the most exciting sounds and then I, I did that and then I decided that this album needed to have actually more of a concept and be more cohesive I was, I was sort of looking for a more cohesive thing and then when I realized that my inspiration of live music and live bands and like 1970s recordings mm. uh was gonna be the thing then I just kind of followed that so you you end up with this which is yeah extremely live and loose lots of mistakes and you know humans you can hear that there's people on it 
So, yeah. yeah, I mean, was that just, was that merely um, just a choice of personal taste, or do you also feel personally that uh, maybe that's a sound that's kind of lacking in, you know, the, the modern music landscape a lot of the time, with everything being as kind of sequenced and digitized as it is? Hmm, I... I don't know if it's lacking. I think it is out there. And it, it, for me, yeah, it's a personal taste thing for these songs. Mm. I feel like these particular songs, this is how they should be. Um, but it's not to say that I wouldn't go somewhere else sonically for my next project. I think it's just it needed to be this raw because of the content of the songs. Um, but, yeah, I think in in modern music, what I personally always want to hear is is the perfect amount of digitized and human at the same time. Sure. So that's personally what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Just find like a symbiotic balance between the two. Mm-hmm. Because I, I like, I mean, really, if you dissect a lot of these songs as well, you'll hear that there are programmed beats inside of them and then I've played like a looser guitar over it or the vocal is really loose. Um, or I've got like my drummer to play along to the program beats as well. Hmm. So, yeah. And sort of going about it in this way, did did this involve, I guess, more studio time anticipated uh, prior, a lot of takes, you know, just like this whole performance doesn't sound exactly the way that we want. We've got to do it all over again, essentially. Hella takes, hella studio time. Yeah, like I probably underestimated the amount of um, revisions mm. we'd have to do because I've never done an entire album this way before. I did a couple of songs on the last album. I did, um, what was it, Green and Gold on mm. Blood was the live one and Unstoppable was a live one. But yeah, never took on an entire project. So there were times, yeah, where I was like, oh, no, I've spent all this time and money in the studio and it, it's not right and what are we going to do? But you just don't panic and you just do it until you get it right and it's all okay in the end because nobody knows about all of that once <laughs> once you release it. So, yeah. You know, you talk uh, earlier about blood being... Um a record where you're trying a lot of things and attempting a lot of things and just kind of seeing what pans out. But, um, you know, I, I hear a similar amount of diversity and versatility in this record as well, but it's a lot more subtle. You know, there are some tracks that seem to be a little bit more influenced by dance music, or maybe there's a beat that has a bit of a hip hop flair, or there are some songs that mm -hmm. uh, maybe have a bit more of a touch of soul. I mean, was there a conscious effort to sort of make sure that you're incorporating all of these different sounds, but making sure it all comes together, feeling a lot more unified? Uniform by the end of it? I guess that was my intention, mm -hmm. but I didn't necessarily have a plan to do it like that, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Like, I'm always to some extent exploring anyway when I'm when I'm writing or recording. So there's a lot of stuff that was just sort of discovered from the process of doing it. Um, but yeah, as a as I set out to do it, I just wanted to um, make something that got all of my interests into <laughs> the whatever. I'm always trying to make the ultimate song, the ultimate culmination of everything I'm influenced by. Hmm. Um, speaking of the more personal angle of this record, I mean, it's, it's yeah. pretty clear from listening to it, but... Um, if, if we could go into, I guess, what I read as, uh, I suppose, a narrative progression to the songs. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't read like a literal word for word story, but it seems like the feelings behind the tracks move in a certain direction as the album, you know, sort of comes yes. to completion. Um, you know, w w what exactly is this story that you're telling on on this record without, I guess, um, you know, because cl clearly there's an effort to not get so personal that you're, um, mm -hmm. you know, divulging everything and, and I guess sort of like, uh, uh, I, I guess in a way incriminating yourself <laughs> in a way yeah. personally. But, um, you know, yeah. if, if you could go into the, uh, the process of, I guess, making an album that does have more of an emotional progression to it, you know, without uh, uh, going to places where you don't want to go, I guess. 
yeah um i thought you were gonna like ask tell me the name of the, oh. of the guy <laughs> no 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 I, 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 l- l- listen I, personally I, I, don't, I don't give i don't give a shit about the guy's name <laughs> You know, just uh, Good. If, if, yeah. if 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 you you know if if you could just go into the, you know, I I, I need to start telling the story here. I need it to finish mm-hmm. here, and yeah. you know, basically trying to assess all of these moments, I guess, through that personal progression that you felt like you needed to embody in a song. You know, it is yeah. uh, uh, m- mostly what I'm interested in. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. No. I, it was. So it, so it starts at the beginning, which I see the song bittersweet i kind of see that as the prologue Mm. let's say so it kind of tells you what the rest of the album is about Mm. and then i think each song after that dissects a piece of um where bittersweet left you can't speak um it's uh chronological a lot of it was kind of written as these moments were happening in my life. So yeah, so you've got, you've got stuff happening from five years ago that I, you know, kind of made a note and then started a thing and then picked it up later when I had lived the experience. Um, And yeah, and it, uh, it kind of goes through the arc of, let's say maybe a toxic relationship um don't really like that word but it it kind of it kind of is that basically and then it ends up in a neutral place i think with the song sour flower um which i see it as kind of hopeful but there's still some work to do that i'm you know it's like a to be continued at the end and there is a middle which is kind of my um, my descent, I guess, you know, the, the breaking down of the relationship and my own rock bottom. Mm. And then I, yeah, I get to a neutral place with Soundflower. So I hope that helps. Yeah. I mean, that, that was, uh, sort of one of my questions going into this thing because it has been five years since the release of blood. And, you know, personally, I was curious as to like everything artistically and, and I guess to a degree personally that has kind of brought you to this point. And, and what you're saying is essentially like what's been going on for the past five years is, is literally mm. the story that you're, you're telling on this record. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Obviously I did loads of other stuff, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but emotionally um, and, you know, just uh, in who I am and where, where I am, that's what was going on. Hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, being familiar with your work and your back catalog, you're obviously no uh, stranger to covers. And um, mm-hmm. you decided to include one in the track list of this record that I'm sure that you've gotten a lot of questions about. Uh, yeah. But you include a, a, a version of Weird Fishes, uh, Radiohead's Weird Fishes on mm-hmm. this record. Um, do you want to go, uh, because I have numerous questions about it, I guess uh, the first one off the bat before we get into the process of sort of coming through with what you did musically here, is how would you say the cover kind of plays into the the narrative of the album itself, you know, since we're still kind of on that? I remember when I was recording it with my band, um, it was at a sort of turning point for me personally uh, in my personal life and my, you know, I felt like I had turned a corner basically. Um, And so I remember recording it and just, it just feeling incredibly appropriate (laughs) Um, for the time we were doing it. The fact that we were all together as a band for the first time um, recording together as this band. Uh, We had been together for a while, but we had only played a couple of gigs. Mm. Uh, And so it was like a good confirmation that that was the right way to go. That was the right direction. But also after we recorded it, I listened back and, and it struck me that the lyrics were resonating with where I was at in my life. Um, And it's, it's it's kind of yeah it's kind of the the end of that bit and the start of another bit so i found it interesting that because i hadn't 
written anything like that for the album. Mm. Um, and I found that I could just sing what Tom York sang instead. And it says it, it says it for me. <laughs> said exactly the emotion I wanted to convey. So, yeah. And, and you know, what do you say of uh, the way that you instrumentally re-embodied the track? Because it's, I imagine it's a difficult song to cover because it's not exactly a super clear or, um, I, I guess, very poppy and basically structured tune in the way that, I don't know, something like, uh, your land is my land, my, <laughs> like, like that yeah. sort of thing is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the, the soul of the song is also really attached to the way it progresses too, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that particular rhythm and that particular guitar line and almost the crescendo that it reaches at the end. Um, yes. You know, how how do you decide to when covering such a song, decide, you know, pick where, I guess, essentially pick what to take with you, pick what to leave and pick which bits of it you can put your own, I guess, kind of spin on. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I was told to, you know, everyone was like, Oh my God, what are you going to cover? Weird fishes, like so. Everyone's so protective over that song, <laughs> which I understand, but I just think it's a really well constructed song. Mm. So in my mind, that makes it uh, quite simple in my head to mm. to deconstruct and then make my own version. So the first thing we did was we just made it half time because I love half time. Mm. Everything should be in half time. Um, <laughs> And then I was immediately, you know, in a new kind of place with it. And I was just already into it when it was half time. And then the chords are just amazing chords. They're just really beautiful voicings. So it turned out that those are some chords I've used in my own songs. So I was like, oh yeah, it's actually really easy to play. So did that. And then you know, some backing, but just kept it really simple. Just had all the elements that are, were available to me. And me and my band arranged it and it just felt good. So we decided to go with that, but basically made it half time. <laughs> mm. um, you know, to, to uh, get a little bit deeper into the uh, you know, the Radiohead topic. I mean, generally, what are your thoughts on uh, on In Rainbows? Because uh, while the album, mm-hmm. I mean, I love the record, a lot of people love the record, and the album was really well received at the year that it came out. But now that, you know, we're, we're kind of going a decade on from the release of the album, it seems like, you know, a lot of people read the record as being one of, one of Radiohead's greatest classics and almost like contending with, you know, um, their greatest stuff. You know, do you feel like the album yeah. for you personally has kind of reached that peak too? It's always been my favorite. Hmm. Wow. No, that's controversial because they've got such a it's, huge it's, back it's a, catalog. It's a take that's growing less and less controversial, though. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, back it's, when I first heard it and decided that that was my favorite, everyone would love to argue with me. Like, sure. oh, no, but what about OK Computer? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, of mm-hmm. course, it's excellent. But no, In Rainbow's has a quality about it that is really simultaneously ahead of its time and classic. Mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely maintained that. And I can't believe that it's 10 years old, over 10 years old. Like when you said that, I got shocked. I know it feels weird with it being that old, but the older that it does get, the kind of the the what makes it special in Radiohead's discography I think becomes clearer and clearer because mm-hmm. no other album in their catalog sort of has that same linear hypnotic consistently groovy kind of quality to yeah. it you know and there's I mean and there's that's definitely... everything I like about music mm. basically <laughs> they've got all of these like incredible arpeggios like it's so well recorded as well. Yes. Like, can we just give a shout out to uh, Nigel Godrich and mm. whoever else worked on it? Cause it just sounds so timeless and so like <laughs> elegant, but really loose and organic as well. So mm. yeah, I think it's perfect. And, um, you know, not to get you in more trouble or anything, but uh, <laughs> the, the, 
The King of Limbs. Do you feel like the album is generally overrated or underrated or? Uh... I don't want to answer that. It's, <laughs> it, I, I will say that it was a perfect follow up to In Rainbows, but I still think In Rainbows for me is just so classic. It's it's it. I feel like that one captured the time differently. Hmm. Let's say. Hmm. Um, I want to move on to and ask you uh, some questions specifically about the guitar. Um, you know, you have uh, always stuck out to me not just as someone who uh, is not just a singer songwriter, but someone who prides themselves uh, as a guitarist too, and someone who has some unique skills and I guess a unique flair on the instrument. And um, the way that your songs have been produced in the past, I think have really sort of like, you know, put out some really fun and quirky, prominent rhythms and strumming patterns and, and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, where, where does sort of your focus for that lie right now especially given that you know the, the vibe of this album generally was just so mellow and it didn't seem you know the the point was to hit the audience with all these like um i guess a uh, uh, very uh prickly textures and sort of like you know bright hard hitting licks and, and that sort of thing you know i mean is, mm. is that something that you feel like is still a part of your toolbox and sort of like your 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 skills as a guitarist do you feel like that's something that you're still concentrating on and honing Absolutely. Um, this was a different, slightly different approach. I mean, for me, when I was making this album, it was so like, I learned so many new guitar things, mm. basically. So, but because it's, I got to indulge in having a band as well. Um, I had to adapt my guitar parts to be part of you know to be part of a of a whole ensemble mm. this time but if you isolate them again like I'm, I'm playing stuff I never really played before or heard before so it was a whole process of discovering what would be the right rhythm for this particular feeling or you know this particular drum beat or vice versa is working out how to make everything work together but no absolutely i play probably more guitar on this hmm. uh album than any of the others <laughs> and there's some that i need to actually learn how to play <laughs> and sing at the same time because hmm. yeah yeah i mean there's definitely a um uh, th th there's there's something about i guess um while a lot of the, a lot of the guitar parts come off sonically quite nuanced, there is definitely like a complexity to uh, a lot of the playing that you're doing on the record, which I imagine you know could be tough. Uh, you know, figuring out a, a kind of a performance angle for it, as opposed to just kind of pulling it together in the studio. Exactly, hmm. exactly. And I think you know, basically not being able to go on tour this year. Um, that would have been my time to like get really comfortable with the band and you know find our find our pocket um on these new songs but don't worry i'll do it next year you know with the um the pandemic affecting things in the way that it has how do you feel like you know that has altered either i don't know um the reception of the album or your, or your creative process in general, because I, I, I know that uh, creatively you've, uh, you did, you did that music video recently. That was almost like, you know, almost a bit of a quarantine type theme, I, mm -hmm. I, I suppose. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, what, it, it, how has, you know, this kind of been affecting you personally in your creative process, you know, uh, assuming that you're willing to talk about that, given that you've sort of reflected in, in your work in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was, it was unintentional, Obviously, nobody planned on this year being this way. Yeah. Um, and if I'm honest, you know, it hasn't been the most uh, smooth of releases. <laughs> um, there are definitely a lot of emotional ups and downs for me um, during this during this time. Um, but at the same time, I feel like if I had waited 
to release it. I, it may just have not, I, I would have maybe lost personal momentum with it, you know, because I had been holding on to it for so long. I thought, well, I made it in order to release it, so I might as well release it. But yeah, I think the quarantine just sort of made other things a bit more complicated, like obviously not being able to play the songs to to humans in a room. Um, and also, you know, not being able to do video shoots or having to rethink a lot of things. So in some ways it was really fun mm. to rethink the visual aspect, but in a lot of ways, because I didn't plan on it and I have, don't feel like I was quite prepared, um, I found it quite restrictive. Mm. But yeah, now things seem to be looking a little more hopeful. I'm, yeah, I'm going to be able to do more stuff in the near future. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, the vaccine announcements recently have been uh, pretty uh, encouraging. Um, yes. We'll uh, take some fan questions now. I have a bunch in front of me. And if okay. you guys want to uh, submit more, as I said earlier, there is a tab underneath this module on Twitch where it says Q&A. You can submit a question and the mods will add a little bit more as we uh, continue through the interview. Um, Third Robe wants to know, um, I, I think this one's pertinent to what you had mentioned, uh, uh, you know, related to what you had mentioned earlier. Um, mm -hmm. What or uh, who inspired you to... I guess take more of a, a primary role over the production of your music. Mm. You know, was it sort of the process of your earlier records or a certain producer or the production on a certain album or something? I mean, what kind of drove you, drove you in that direction? Um, I think it was really because that's, that's where I started. That's how I started. And I've always felt very strongly about how my own music should sound. And I think mm. a lot of, a lot of artists, particularly maybe female young artists, don't want to get too, I don't want to get in trouble, but basically I think a lot of us, when we're starting out, get told that we need to work with this producer and that we need to work with this guy and that guy and a load of strangers and make a hit in 12 hours with someone you've never met. Hmm. So I guess this album was my opposition to that way of thinking. I basically, I used to just sit on my computer and make all my own beats and record everything myself. And it wasn't until like I got signed that I had the opportunity. I don't want to act like it wasn't a great thing because I met some incredible producers and I've learned so much over this time. So I think I got the confidence back mm. to take on my own project again you know like I've, I've learned what I like and learned what I don't like from doing it that way um and so now I was able to kind of have the authority and you know to work with people that trust me artistically to help me achieve the thing that I wanted to achieve yeah you're, you're going back to your roots essentially mm -hmm. um you know we have a lot of creatives who watch the stream so uh you know it's yeah. not uh surprising that we get uh questions like this next one from uh, Naley Boy. This person wants to know, uh, how often do you personally feel like you are dealing with a bout of maybe writer's block or something? And, mm. and how do you sort of work through the process of overcoming it? Maybe even in a, uh, uh, I guess, a context where maybe you're in the studio and the the need to sort of like punch through it is is very immediate. Um, I mean, it's the worst when it happens in the studio, especially when it's being paid for. For some reason, that really induces anxiety for me. Um, I, think, I think for everyone and, to a degree. Yeah, like, and therefore just nothing comes. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it, yeah, I definitely, like any creative person, I'm assuming I have dealt with that a lot. <laughs> just a lot like basically whenever I'm not writing I feel like oh no I've got writer's block and then when you actually sit down to do it just some days you're just like I have no idea but I think it's just a case of not being um critical of yourself too much like not um not 
treating yourself badly because you know not acting like there's something wrong with you mm. i think that will make you feel more blocked so i like to take it easy on myself and just step away from it relax do something else creative because doing other things will inspire the thing you want to do i think mm. so just take yourself out of the situation if you can i don't know go for a walk watch a film films are so underrated for musicians to be inspired by there's so many cool things going on in cinema so mm. maybe that's what i like to do so. um lab city asks about the song bittersweet uh saying yeah. it's one of their favorite songs of yours it, was there a specific inspiration for the chorus on that one I don't know if there was a specific inspiration, but it does remind me, now that you've asked the question, it does remind me of one of my favourite songs of all time by Jill Scott, um, where it's basically, she starts low, it's a long walk. Hmm. She starts off low, she does the chorus low the first time and then belts it at the end. And I always wanted to make a song where I could physically do that because i hmm. love that song um and this was my opportunity to do that and I, it sort of just came about it just was in the right key for it to be low and high for me so yeah uh, next, we have an uh, unknown geek who I know has popped in uh, on a few streams that we've had. Uh, they want to know if if you have a, a perfect pitch. Do you have perfect pitch or uh, or relative uh, pitch or, or anything like that? Relative. What is relative pitch again? Is relative when you it's, it's, can it's, remember it. it. It's it's you you could pretty much. Um, you, you you could pretty much nail the melody, but you can't um you you can't tell what the note is. Like if someone just randomly yeah. sang an F, you can oh that's an F, you know. Essentially. Yeah, no, I think I have relative pitch, but okay. I know some people with perfect pitch, and it is weird. <laughs> it's so it's witchcraft. Is like, it, what do you mean you know what that is? How do you know? It? I think you can probably teach yourself it though. Maybe, you know, it's, I, I feel like, a, you know, do, do you feel like that's a superpower in a way? Like, do, do, do you sometimes personally feel like you'd be a, like a songwriting god if you just knew what all the notes were just off the top oh, yeah. of Yeah, or you might be constantly afflicted with this thing. Like, you just know what every note is. Like, that, when the kettle is on. Exactly. Or when the fire alarm is going, like, <laughs> you might just be like need silence need yeah I've, silence. I've 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 seen some people where a glass clinks and they're like that's a c and it's like how why <laughs> how why would you you're just showing off that's disgusting but yeah it's yeah like what is the point <laughs> it's pro it's probably an affliction it pro it's probably worried of it's probably like seeing dead people everywhere like you just see you yeah. just perfectly hear a note in everything <laughs> <laughs> the Haley Joel Osmond of notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, we, we usually get a lot of questions about uh, other contemporary artists and, and this individual okay. wants to know uh, Lo uh, Celso. Uh, they're curious uh, as to who are some of your favorite UK rappers if, if, if that's, you know, if, if you mm. follow the scene closely at, at all these days. Yeah. Um, Little Sims. Yes, she love love her. Is, I just find her so inspiring. She's mm. amazing. She's amazing. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm a little biased. I'm a friend of hers, but I just think she's really important. Um, and there's no one doing what she's doing, and I love that. Um, also, I mean, I've got to say Stormzy. Mm -hmm. He's so he's so brilliant he grew up near me so he's like repping the south i love it um and he's just got so much charisma and personality and just you know he's a star i think he's an absolute star and also then therefore i've got to mention dizzy rascal as well mm -hmm. because he yeah he just paved the way for people like stormzy i think and sims so so yeah, he's a legend, and um, also Roots Maneuver, mm -hmm. Jamaican. He's amazing. Mm -hmm. Jamaican British. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I, you know, I've been listening to Dizzy and listening to artists like The Streets since I was in college when, like, mm-hmm. I don't know, there were, like, um, you know, friends of mine in America who would be weirded out by the fact, why are you listening to a British person rap? Interesting. Know, English person rap. Yeah. Like, it's, that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's very much, that, that's very much been a conception for a long time. And, and even though I think that's, like, still sort of there for whatever fucking reason like some americans just can't get over an accent i don't know why but yeah. it, it's, it seems like yeah. there's generally a bit more openness and mm-hmm. I, I think that's also evidenced in the fact that you have so many you know new york artists who are kind of reappropriating the drill thing or the way drill has sort of re-embodied itself over there you know so mm. i mean it's it's definitely not as equitable as it should be in terms of like appreciation for one another's craft it's not as much as a two-way yeah. street as i think it should be but yeah. um, it, it, it seems I like it's, it's getting, interesting it, it's getting more attention than it used to i mean over here i think it's getting at least more than it, 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 it it's it's getting closer to where it should be i think sort yeah of. You know. Yeah, I hope so because that isn't that is the thing that I've always thought as well. Because you find as well that you know sometimes we feel we've got to change our accent to be accepted in America, mm. <laughs> perhaps you know, or you see like a slight transition just for it to appeal to an American audience. But I think that I don't know if we just persist, then maybe it'll be fine. <laughs> You know, I would I would hope so, especially given like the um, more of the openness that we're seeing toward various Latin styles of music and K-pop right now. It seems like there's less of, there's less of a need generally for the music to even be in English, you know. So, yeah, I would hope that people could just get over a fucking accent. You know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yeah, if they're just if they're listening to the music as well, then it shouldn't mm, matter. Exactly. Uh, flavor. <laughs> This person's name, Flavor Town Citizen. <laughs> what? Is this? Does this person watch the Food Network? I, I'm guessing. Flavor Town. So. I'm guessing so. It's 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 got an O U R though, so I'm imagine they they must be watching it over in the U K or maybe in Canada. I don't know, but wait, um, you don't wait. I, wait, I, I, yeah. you don't have O U R in Flavor. Uh, we we just do O R. It's F L A V O R. Yeah, we 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 totally we, we skip the U. The U's not even there. The U, we, That's we just so don't weird. Do the U. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, it's Flavour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, the, this person wants to know um, what 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 what's your generally your guitar of choice these days, and what guitar did you use for? The record primarily you know, the in, in, in a lot of, um, you know, uh, the stuff that you're recording these days, like what kind of tones and timbres are you going for and what models are, are bringing you those sounds that you that you're looking for? Um, so I'm looking around because I've got just a bunch of guitars. You're surrounded there. by guitars right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. There's like a two here, three over there. Um, <laughs> I love my pride and joy, my tried and true Harmony Stratotone from mm. 1964. Um, it's really, really nice. I got it just before I recorded my first album. So that's the song. Sorry, that's the guitar I'm talking about mm. on the album. And it's um, it's hollow body. It's very light. Uh, and when I played it the first time, it just thought it sounded kind of like a piano in a weird way. It was very round and full yet very delicate and just, I just thought it was perfect so I have dabbled obviously in a few other guitars I've got some love for Gibson and I've got some love for Fender mm. um, but that's been basically the one you do hear a Strat though there is a Strat on the album on the song Green Papaya mm. and there is a nylon string guitar which is my second love just I love classical guitar Hmm. So um, I've been getting into a lot of nylon string things. So I've got the nylon and the harmony. Yeah, there's a lot of great nylon recordings out there. Um, you know, that's what makes some records like a, like some, you know, Phil Elvrum, some Mount Erie records pretty special for me. It really kind of brings that very rustic tone that sort of fits his songwriting about trees and wind and mountains and so on and so forth it, it definitely kind of that sounds that really i'm gonna be honest i don't know mount erie yeah uh check I, out i want to 
Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Let me write the, this down. I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I'll send a message or something. But uh, you yeah. know, the glow part two, great record. Okay. The glow part okay. two, or um, even a uh, uh, one of his latest records, uh, which also follows a, a, a narrative too. A crow looked at me, which um, you know is uh, uh, the primary songwriter of the project Phil Elvram the 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 album is actually about the passing of his wife it's it's quite heartbreaking but um mm. you know it's it's a it's a really kind of uh dark and stunning record and it really does have kind of that dark rustic quality to it because of the instrumentation that he that he uses mm -hmm. um uh, a few people have been asking uh in the questions here if there are uh Based on the previous collaborations that you've done, any artists that you're looking forward to collaborating with in the near future, maybe when the pandemic sort of subsides? Mm -hmm. um, excuse me. Um, it's well, I think thankfully we can do a lot of things remotely. Yeah. So there are some collaborations that I'm going to be doing remotely. Hmm. Um, I. I mean, I, I don't want to reveal that yet, you know, just because it hasn't happened yet. Um, but there it's, are. It's not like, a Gorillaz album, is it? Are you going to be on the new Gorillaz album? You should, you should, <laughs> no, you should I wish. be. On, how are you not on a fucking Gorillaz album? Yet? But you know, they need just, to call me Damon. Damon, call me. <laughs> Damon. <laughs> Damon. Damon. Okay. You're down the street from me, Damon. Come on. <laughs> um, no, that would be cool. I'm. A, big Gorillaz fan hmm. since back in the day. Um, but no, uh, there's some people I would love to collaborate with. One of them being um, Missy Elliott, hmm. because she's a legend. Hmm. Um, and I grew up listening to her music and I adore it. Um, I'd also love to work with maybe Anderson Pack. Hmm. I think he's just insanely talented eccentric wonderful person um also no name hmm. i love no name she's just a unique being i think she's incredible i think she's the future um and i just love her her tone and her voice and also i love little dragon hmm. i'd love to collaborate with little dragon loads of people really that i'd love to work with too many to to say. Yeah, one one of the most interesting things about Missy uh, is is sort of the way I guess this younger generation is like rediscovering her. You know, I, I can't quite explain that, yeah. but there was that kind of period of relative creative silence for her, over which I think like a lot of people who are younger than me sort of didn't really become familiar with her at all and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden she's like at the super bowl with katie perry and people are like who the hell is this person i don't know who this is why why yeah. who is this and you know then she's been getting all of this love recently from artists like lizzo and so on and so mm -hmm. forth and it's been this really interesting rediscovery you know that that uh i i feel like um you know just a lot of people are uh not really kind of i guess just familiar with her work it's it's been strange now that I've gotten older as you know kind of referring back to our conversation about Radiohead's in rainbows turning as old as it is which yeah, seems weird this at this point is new territory it's, 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 it's weird to sort of see and think about the artists that I remember being popular around that time or, or you know being really influential around that time and yes. you know it's it's curious to see like how despite a similar level of silence like a Missy Elliott sort of becomes almost like faded away a little bit in terms of her popularity, but a Lauren Hill sort of like Lauren Hills, like right there burning like the sun, like <laughs> no yeah. matter, no matter what, like mm -hmm. every day is a Lauren Hill day. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, where, whereas like people... these, these women are so relevant though. They're mm. just still relevant. And I think we come from assuming we're from a similar generation. Mm. Um, we come from that unique spot where we didn't have like the internet when we were born, hmm. but we've seen these changes and that, you know, that music from then and just, you know, so that was basically it's like a, a recent history, you know, very recent. So that stuff I think now is still very relevant and timeless, even though it was from you know, it will hold some nostalgia, but I still think you could put on um, the miseducation. It could have come out tomorrow 
and it would have still been really amazing. Hmm. You know, for, for yourself personally, as, um, you know, you, uh, get older, you're a more seasoned artist. Do you feel like nostalgia plays a stronger role in your creative process or anything like that? Or are you someone who creates? Wait, do I feel know, like what? Do, do, you, do you feel like nostalgia plays a larger role in your creative process as you look back on your career and maybe sort of your years of getting into music? Or are you, you know, mm. when you're in a creative spot, are you looking for specifically like what's new? How can I break ground? How can I challenge myself to do something different? I'm doing literally both. I'm mm. thinking both when I'm, mm. I'm doing that. And I was thinking that, you know, back 10 years ago when I was making my first stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely more so now, cause like when I was making this album, truth is I was listening to a ton of all the music I listened to when I was 12, like loads of Tony Braxton, Destiny's Child, um, Missy Elliott, you know, Buster Rhymes, all of that stuff. Mm while simultaneously, you know, think, you know, listening to very modern music and also wondering where it's going, you know, listening to loads of trap and all of this, you, you know, very unusual, you know, well, it would have been unusual if it had come out in the year 2003. Sure. So, yeah, I, I am kind of always trying to, be halfway between everything all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not that you um, strike me as somebody who avoids things that are new or poo poos new trends or anything like that, but uh, creatively, no matter what point of your career that you've been in, you've always struck me as being very above above the fray. Like it couldn't mm -hmm. matter if I don't know. Um, tubas were the newest fucking hottest thing that popped up in every track you're going to do what yeah. you're going to do like you know it could Absolutely. be raging outside there could be a tsunami going on you know but you're gonna you're focused on what you're doing and you know your world and it's going to come out that yeah. way regardless i i have a thing about that i feel like i can hear when something sounds of the time oh. or like if it i don't know sometimes stuff sounds already dated to me when it comes out <laughs> so i feel like i feel like i purposely want to get in a bubble and I, d I don't like to be influenced sometimes by by current things you know i i intentionally push that away so that i can make something that i know i'm gonna like forever mm. rather than you know I, I, that being said, though, I would love to make, you know, like a hit song. Um, and even if it was one hit for like this year, like mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to know what that feels like. But I do wonder 10 years down the line, if I made a hit today, would I like it in 10 years? Mm. You know. So n next year when the album drops, there's going to be that one song with like the 808s are going to be on there and the hi-hats are going to be going triplet and, you know, that's, 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 that's how that's going to go. You never know. You never know. <laughs> or you'll hear that influence in a timeless way. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. All right. Um, well, you've been a fantastic guest. Uh, thank you for coming through. God, this that's has been... flown by. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. Yeah, got... been... What? How? Been... We've been talking. Time is moving faster now that you know we're millennials. <laughs> I, I I I agree. I feel like the pandemic has also sped it all up for some reason too. I feel like days are just yeah. blending together, and the beginning it's of the true. week doesn't matter much more than the end of the week. It's no, really it's odd. like before you blink, and it's six months has gone by. It's crazy. Yeah, kinda. It it feels like it doesn't feel like it's almost been a year of this, but yeah, like it literally has. Dude. The longest, shortest year of my life. <laughs> the longest, <laughs> shortest year ever. It's so weird, the whole thing. But yeah, I hope. can I just say, I hope everyone out there is keeping well. And mm -hmm. I'm just sending you all my love and, you know, positive thoughts. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go do something useful now. Okay. Like you're... after this, I'll continue to do. I hope people have found this useful as well. Yeah. My answers. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead and do whatever you got to do. We appreciate you coming through and we'll look forward to the new music and the new record. Yeah. And uh, you've yeah, inspired just, uh, me to continue to be creative. Sometimes I need a boost and this has given me that boost. Be creative. Uh, and, and, you know, if, and, and if, and if Damon Albarn is down the street from you, just fucking kick, Damon. Down, kick down that fucking door, <laughs> kick down that, just grab one of your guitars and just like hack through the door with it and just be like, I'm right here. Like, what the fuck? Yo, hello. <laughs> yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll figure this out and, and I'll get back to you. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks right. for having me. No problem. Have a good one. You too.